Welcome everyone. We're so happy you could all be here. Um, if it's your first time here at Namaste, uh, feel free to inquire about services or anything uh, that you might be interested in or we can give you a tour around the space tonight. We are here, um, I feel very honored and privileged to introduce you to Shar Lee. She is lineage holder of our Tibetan cr cranial practice. And she's gonna be telling us about her story, uh, how she came to learn the practice, talk a little bit um, uh, about if you are interested in receiving or learning the practice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, easy, easy, comfortable here. So before these talks, because no one really believes it, but I'm basically a really shy person. And no one, <laughs> no one, when I say that, no one believes it. <laughs> but usually what I would do is, is I would sit and meditate for about 10, 15 minutes before I would do the talk. So that I could get centered. And then I realized that you all need to meditate for a few minutes beforehand. So how we're going to start today is we're going to start with just a little bit of meditation. Just a little bit of centering and going in. Is that okay with everybody? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, also, I like, and one thing about it, your meditation, but I, I appreciate um, questions. I appreciate you. I'd rather this be a dialogue than a lecture. I'd rather it be uh, like we're sitting in the living room together and we're just talking. It makes me feel more comfortable, makes you feel more comfortable. And your question is valid because your question is somebody else's question. Do you, do you understand? So usually if it's in your field, it's also in other people's field. So be brave and ask questions. If I have to talk to you, it's fun. <laughs> All right, so let's just sit. We're gonna do three ohms. So just sit, get nice and focused. You might wanna close your eyes. You might wanna find your breath. You might wanna call in your unicorn or whatever you're gonna call it. <laughs> Sarah's got the unicorn, that's her deity. So whatever you need to do, just start to come into the place of breath. The breath is the bridge between the mind and the body. The bridge is what, the breath is what unites us all together. So close your eyes, go into your breath, feel the sacredness, and realize that no two people breathe alike on this planet. But we all breathe. And when you're ready to take a nice deep inhale, and let's go ahead and do three ohms.
meditate, maybe some more work, one breath. So thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for meditating together. So let's go ahead and start with this bit of a talk. They're never the same <laughs> because this we're never the same people in the room with me. So it's always a little bit different. I'm going to just start out with a little bit of how I came to find the work, or how it found me. It's one of those, why would I ask you to know? I was born a Christian. I was born a Catholic. That's, that's pretty Christian. Um, and my mother knew that I was really never going to make it to confirmation. She would put me in one door, and I would be out the other door. So we made a deal, and the deal was, if you get confirmed in the Catholic Church, I'll let you experiment with any type of spiritual modality you'd like to. Good deal, I thought, that's what I thought. So I'm 14, and I'm thinking, this is a good deal. I was. Did my confirmation in the Catholic Church? That was the last day I went to the Catholic Church. I did my part. I got the confirmation, but that was it. I didn't say I'd go to church anymore. I said I'd do that, and I did. And the next day, my mother drove me to the uh, Buddhist Center, uh, two, three towns away, and would sit in the car while I learned what I was learning. And she did it weekly. She got in the car with a book and waited for me to finish. So there was that first part of that journey. Another part of the journey is I was always in dance. I, was a, I did ballet. And then I went from ballet to skating. So I was not ice skating, quad wheel skating, skating, double skating, dance skating. Um, again, in a Catholic facility with the nuns. I skated around, but I skated around. Um, and my coach said, um, you need to do yoga now. I'm telling you, okay, you know I'm not young. I'm in my 70s, and 
so I'm definitely not young. And uh, I could, I didn't know what yoga was. You say yoga now, people have an idea what it is. Yoga clothes, yoga stuff, you see yoga in commercials. But back in the, that has to be like the 60s, the early 60s, um, late 50s, yoga, no one knew what yoga was. And I was near Northwestern University and this cute little Indian guy who was a student at the university had a yoga class that he had for, you know, mostly it was college professors and their, and their wives and me. And I'm 16. And now, and, I'm, and I, I kind of like it, but I can't figure it out why I like it. We do eight poses every week, the same thing, without any warm-ups or anything. We take eight classical poses every week. And I'm going, hmm, okay, kind of boring, very boring. <laughs> and then, he's a college student. I mean, he had to be 19 or 20 years old. But he was Indian, so that was his claim to fame. And the little girls liked him, the little college girls liked him. So he'd have me teach the classes, because I was very flexible, and he'd have me teach the classes, and he would go in the back room with those little girls, I don't know what he was doing, but it wasn't any of my business. <laughs> and I wasn't getting paid anything for it. This went on for a long time, not very smart, you know, like, I'm, he's making money, <laughs> I'm taking the classes, and he's also getting fringe benefits. And I started understanding that I liked yoga. Does it make sense? Mm -hmm. I'm not changing to yoga. But we're not talking in today. This is, <coughs> this is a long time ago. Yeah, we're talking like 55, 60 years ago. So I already had this wonderful spiritual influence. Also, I was a child, again, of the 60s. With all the Haight Ashbury stuff going on and the war in Vietnam stuff going on and all that stuff going on. But I've never been a person that wanted to just go sit on a beach and drink a pina colada. That just sounds like my idea of not the place you want to go. <laughs> so I've always, I started studying with healers. The first healers I started studying with were Native Americans, medicine men. So then I started studying with shamans in different places in the world. So I would go on these, and I'm st I still was doing it for quite a long time. And I am married, and I'm not sure why he's still married to me. I would say to my husband, with and three kids, I'm going to leave next week or in two weeks to go to India, and I'll be back in a few months. I don't know when. I don't know where. And, and goodbye. And I think my children still need therapy from that because I would just disappear. And it was before cell phones, so they didn't have, you couldn't just call somebody. Sometimes it would take me days to find a place to make an international phone call. And my deal was I would call him every 10 days to two weeks, just to let him know where I was in the world. And I studied with so many amazing people amazing lamas and saints and amazing people, not only in India, but also in Nepal and in Thailand and in Asia and in South America. It wasn't one trip, it was many trips and I never planned any of them. You know, people plan trips, I'm going somewhere in six months, you know, it, no, it didn't happen that way. It was, it's time to go, I don't know why, and here I am. And, and it was really magical. I always came into so many amazing healers. And what I would do, basically, I was the only little white girl out there. I was traveling by myself almost exclusively. I, don't, I only traveled with a couple people in that whole time. Because you really can't follow where you need to go if you have to say to somebody, hey, you want to go here? You just have to go there. And who would want to travel with me anyways when I was on these strange quests? Um, so as I traveled, and as I uh, kept finding healers, I'd go into a village, and I would say, who is your teacher? Who is your healer? 
who takes care of this community. And I would be introduced to this person, or I would ask to be introduced to this person. I would find them out, and I got to learn so many amazing things. Most of them, the, uh, most of the really amazing people that I met, you really had to say that you were never going to tell anybody where you found them. Because they didn't want to turn into John the God, you know, where everybody in the universe is pouncing in on their on their community, on their healing. So this is going on for probably 25 years. And I'm now in Kathmandu. And I'm very, very familiar with Kathmandu, always have been. I've been, now made 15 trips to Kathmandu, or to Nepal in general. And there's this big hubbub around that there is a healer in, a lama, who is doing this amazing work. So I start asking around, and finally, one of the Tibetans leads me into this long line that went for blocks of people waiting. And of course, I am the only white person there. And my, my normal thing is I am the only white person all of the time, most of the time. That's the way, that's kind of the way it is. And I wait in line, I finally get work from my mama, and I sit at his feet. I realize that this is the person that really resonates with me the most. This work was so profound in all the healing modalities I found up into that time, all the spiritual studies I'd done into that time. This was almost like the pinnacle of where I was going to go, was to be with him. And I, and I sat at his feet, and I still sit, sit at his feet. And I also want to sit at the feet of my, all of my whole community, my, all the apprentices, all the practitioners that also hold this work. This work was so close to extinction. My llama made it out with two other llamas. There's three people. Three people made it out when the Chinese came in and invaded Japan. Three people made it out in his monastery, his field. And he was the last one. Now I know that because I went to the Tibetan Hall of Medical Records later on, not then, but later on to do more discovery and search for them too. And there, maybe there are apprentices out there. So we did a lot of research and a lot of networking went on. And my Lama didn't speak English. I didn't speak Tibetan. And our language was, he would hit me. So if I wasn't being conscious, if I wasn't being in mantra, if I wasn't doing points right, if I was getting tired, I got hit. So I didn't get hit once. I got hit all the time. Because <laughs> either one of, one of those things was going on, and I got hit a lot. No, it wasn't a hit. It was a hit. In fact, when I left, I said, He's probably so happy because his hands are probably so sore from hitting me. <laughs> it hit me so many times. And it was all, I mean, I'm not saying he did it unjustified. He wanted me to stay conscious. And when someone's going to hit you, you're going to stay pretty conscious. And he wasn't doing it out of meanness or unkindness. It was the way he communicated with me. He went, hit a lot. Back of my head, my shoulders, my butt, my back, everywhere. There were all the other ways I wasn't hit. Um, but for some reason, I can't teach it that way. <laughs> we haven't had one apprentice yet, but I'm always doing this, like winding it up, like getting ready to hit him. Because you're not losing and paying attention. Um, it's a standard joke in our community that that's the way it happened. I don't think I've done that yet, but I'm not finished teaching. You know, it might yet still happen. And, and we had, um, he had an assistant, not an apprentice, but an assistant. And this assistant hated me. I'm a white Western woman with three W's. I mean, that's a cow is more sacred. You know, I'm a white Western woman. I'm not very, I'm only in my early 30s. So he, he hated me. So he would translate occasionally. And my mama must have known a little English because 
Every now and then he'd look at me and go, like, it was a telling me the truth. But one of the things that my Lama said was, you have come back in this lifetime in a ridiculous form. Now, I am three years old. I was like, you just really not a whole bunch of fun with this form? You know, what is this ridiculous form? And the other thing that he translated was, I have waited so long for you to finally get here. Well, I had to learn all these other things. One of the things that I had to learn and get more proficient with was pulses. So I've studied Ayurvedic pulses, I've studied Chinese pulses, I've studied Tibetan pulses. I'm pretty good at pulses now. It is kind of my language. And I really believe that pulses are talking to the soul. You can really talk to the soul without having the ego and the personality get in the way. Um, and for this work in particular, I had to know pulses. I didn't know I needed to know pulses. I didn't know what was going on. The other thing that my Lama did, and it's very common, is that he made me do a sit. Now, if I was going to do a sit, I'd have to get into pens for sure. Because you're sitting and you're not able to move. You sit and you don't eat, you don't drink, you don't pee, you don't do anything. You sit. But from the place I had at his feet, I could see what were happening on these two tables that he had. I was watching constantly what he was doing. Oh, you're going to get into pregnant. Oh, I know who that is. Um, so I, I'm, I'm watching what he's doing, and I'm sitting, and then finally on the, I think it was the second or third day, he dropped a human skull in my lap. So I could start following his hands, and the hands go into mudras. They actually form mudras during the time of the work. Are you all following me at all? Mm -hmm. okay. So this work is pretty strange. It really is. I still think it's strange. Um, it is vast. I don't even think we've uncovered all of it yet. There are still layers and layers of this work. Most of the practitioners and teachers all say the same thing like I do. There is so much to it. It's huge. So let me backtrack a little bit. I see I do kind of talk in circles. Um, so this one of the things about this work is it's done with mudras. It's done with pulse diagnosis. It's done in mantra. It's also done in total respect for the being that you're seeing God or goddess on the table. You're able to work with the sacred and the divine of the being. The being on the table has forgotten their divinity, but you don't forget it. You're there to remind them that they are perfect, and they are perfect. The work is also Tibetan, so it's not written. It's an oral tradition. There are no tests he takes. It's, it's all part of your development of your spirituality. And yes, you can learn the technique, but it's not about the technique where it works. It works on a very deep spiritual level. So you spend hours a day in mantra because you are in mantra when you're working with people. I always say I get paid to pray, which is not a bad thing. It's also um, amazing service. Beyond the idea that we're capable of keeping it on the planet. It was so close to extinction. So close to not being here anymore. This amazing jewel, this amazing treasure, this amazing egoless movement almost is lost. I mean, everyone wants to save, you know, the whale or the dolphin, but what about saving a healing modality that helps humanity? Also allows us the greatest gift, which is, I truly believe if you want to be happy this lifetime, you want to be free from suffering and 
ego and you want to be free from despair, service. If you are in service to other beings, what a greater joy can you have? People that are in service are happy people. Can you think of anybody who's in service that isn't happy? And think of one moment in your life, just one, that you were exquisitely happy, and it was when you were helping somebody else. When we extend ourselves to somebody else, we grow. Uh, I was just explaining to a man the other day about, yes, it's nice to be loved, but it's so much more amazing to have someone that you can love. Mm -hmm. Like, well, you know, I want to be loved, but like, who do you love? Who can you open your heart to? And service is really where you get to open your heart to humanity. <coughs> Denise was talking about being an African and feeling there's no boundary, love, service for people that she doesn't usually always feel. Isn't that true? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think that some, t unfortunately, in our Western society, we think of service and slavery. Those are two different things. Service and slavery are not the same. Service is, uh, is a joyful life. Slavery means, you know, like, that someone's going to beat you, but not like my mom wants me to have this. <laughs> So this work, they have, they have dated it to be back to the Buddha tradition, about 3,000 years or more. And we have an opportunity to, to learn it. And I am still learning it. I, I drove up here with Linda, one of the other teachers, and one of the things that we were talking about is always feeling like we don't know enough of it. I've been about 45 years of doing this, and I still don't know all of it. But isn't that exciting? Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? Isn't it exciting mm -hmm. that you have something that is so vast that you can continue to learn? And I learn from everybody who comes out of the table. This is what we work on. Now, it's a little fancier than my teachers. He had two of these, but they were just plywood on, you know, like almost all horses. <laughs> Things he was really supportive. He would go from one table to the other. The system would get people up and down and up and down because all these people were out there waiting to get the work. Now, it took me two years, maybe a little more, to decipher what was going on during my time with my llama two years of backtracking, every single person had very strange brain, obviously, my entertainment here. Um, and I started noticing, figuring it out by the jewelry that they were wearing, because they were all Tibetan. They were, were in Nepali in the group. Uh, a lot of Tibetans love the turquoise. They love this jewelry. And they have to take it off because you can't wear metal. So they would have this jewelry. And I would go back in my mind to realize that they were coming seven consecutive days. Now that took two years, I'm just talking. I had to review everybody to realize that this work was meant to be done seven consecutive days. Ideally, it's our biggest way to do this work. I'm not saying once or twice or as many days done for these seven days in a row. But the seven days go through, go through five different koshas. Koshas are energy center, energy bodies. So you're going through these five koshas in these seven days. You'll go back to other koshas that need help. The way that we do it a little bit more in the Western world, because we're not as, um, I'm not trying to be so general, but our spiritual connection might not be as rich as some of those Tibetans. Okay? We'll just put it that way. Uh, so we might get a session in a week, and maybe another week, maybe a month, maybe three months later. I have two or three yoga friends that say that their sessions last about a year. That's great. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. So it all depends on what someone needs. And people ask me all the time, how often should I come? And 
I go, what do you think? You know, you, I, I will make space for you. That's usually what I say to them. I don't know what that means. And a few times a year, maybe four times a year, or more or less, I do seven days. Other practitioners do seven days. They even share their seven days together um, where they're working with people seven days in a row. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Pretty profound work. Um, Amy and I were just talking. Amy's one of our practitioners that's in this room also. And I've been talking to some of the neurologists around because I work on heads. It, it kind of, they work on heads too. They just do it in a different way. Um, with COVID, and we have this whole new disorder that's been on the planet these few years. <coughs> we're all kind of getting used to this COVID thing. With COVID, either having COVID or having the, the, the shot. Um, it's been it's doing some swelling on brain stems and I personally didn't think that this work would, would work with it but I was wrong it does it's pretty amazing what how much even a session or two does in this this new arena of disorders we don't name a disorder it's better to believe you name a disorder, you empower it. You become that disorder. You become the club of that disorder. You all understand that game? Mm -hmm. So it's like I have this, and now I can have this bad behavior because I have this. Instead of saying, I have a disorder and I want to come into order. So what this work looks at the person as back to order. And they have forgotten their order. Do you understand that? Mm -hmm. So when someone says they're at dis-ease, yeah? What is that saying? They're at dis-ease, not they're dizzy. The, one of my favorite ones is, think of the word incurable. You have to go in to cure it. It doesn't, it means you can't cure it from the outside. So incurable means you're responsible for your own healing. It doesn't mean it's a death sentence, <laughs> unless you decide to stay ignorant. But there are ways to change this order to order. Yeah? Mm -hmm. You all seem to be able to walk in. <laughs> no one's being carried in on a stretcher. So we probably all figured that lesson out a couple of times. Does it all make sense? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it probably makes more sense to you than it really does to me. I'm still trying to figure it out. Uh, so one of the things that, that again, you see how I do, I, I drive my own self crazy, don't I? Um, one of the things that, because I am, don't know much, you know, I'm on the planet, but the clock is ticking on my side now, is trying to see how many people we can work that can hold the work on the planet. How many apprentices, how many practitioners, how many teachers will it take to support this work when I am no longer here? So it, it is an interesting feeling and it is an interesting concept. We are stable enough to where that that's not a big deal. But the apprentices are like jewels to me. They are my, I love the practitioners, no problem, and the teachers, but the apprentices are just so amazing. The whole community is so, one of the most interesting things about this community, this sangha, this community of people, they all have the same pulse. Now, I know that sounds weird, and what is she talking about with same pulse, but they're all running at the same frequency. They all, if I'm gonna give a, a gentle profile of, a, of an apprentice, and this is just a gentle, familiar one, is they really spent most of their life not quite understood because they came in pretty conscious. They do well in community in short amounts of time. They like their own private space 
and um, those people who like everyone in Thailand, they suffered a little bit because of that. Because not everybody's conscious. That's one of the things that when you're con when you're a conscious being, it's hard because you expect your mom, your father, your brother, your sister, everybody you know to be conscious. But con there are only very small percentage of conscious beings on the planet. Maybe 20%, maybe hopefully now 30%, but that's not a lot of people. There are not a lot of people, as we all know, that are not conscious. You drive down the street, I bet you'll see two or three in their cars moving right in front of you. <laughs> yeah, so if they're out there. So to be able to do this work, the first thing the person really has to be committed with is to be committed to service. The other is that they need to have, or will for at the end of the program, have a, a, a decent meditation practice to keep themselves spiritually strong. They're, they're, they're spiritual warriors. You have to stay healthy if you're going to help other people. You don't get sick, to, you don't grab cancer to work in a cancer ward. You have to stay well to help the people in cancer wards. You don't go the other way. You don't have to join the club, you just get out of the club. <laughs> so, they're spiritual athletes. We, in our practice, it is like spiritual boot camp. It's always so funny. We, we start at six in the morning with meditation. We do classes, and there's lectures, there's yoga, there's, and in the evening, you think these people are ready to fall over? They're still like making malas, playing music, still going on. And this goes on with very little sleep for the six days that they're together. It's a lot of movement, a lot of meltdowns, a lot of energy, but never anybody being violent against another person. Everybody's owning their own personal meltdowns, their own personal stuff. It's not like, oh, so-and-so was mean to me, and so now, it's not kindergarten, it's grad school. This is, these are evolved beings. They don't have attitudes towards each other. It is really amazing. Now, I've been a yoga teacher for a long time, again, since I was 16. I have done lots of yoga training. Let me tell you, some of those yoga people are really vicious. <laughs> <laughs> and some of them are really mean to each other, and some of them are really aggressive, and they are really frightening. <laughs> they're not all these sweet little buttercups you think that they are when they're up there teaching the class. When you get them on their own, it's like, oh God, please save me. You know, they're not all of them, but they can they can get on each other. They they think they know everything about yoga. Well, how can you know everything? How do you learn if you know everything? So it's a different situation, but not in this community. This community is so heartfelt, so amazing. It's, it's amazing. I am so honored to be with them. I mean, it is, it's exceptional. Now, the, in this room, we have, we don't have any apprentices in here, do we? Is that true? Mm -hmm. We have teachers, we have practitioners. Do we have any apprentices in here? No. Okay. Doesn't talk about them, right? <laughs> <laughs> but although all the practitioners, are, are they, all, they will all agree with me. Is there anybody in our community that would not agree with me? The bad apples, they fall the left. They do, and that is true. The other amazing thing about this work, and the Lama was very clear about telling me that, it is designed never to harm. It will never harm designed not to harm. So what Heidi just said is someone could, could be in the community, but it wasn't the right timing for them, you know, and they're just, they get blown out of it. They just go away, they're not there anymore. They don't come back. I don't, I've only had one, and maybe one and a half, people that I have, maybe there'll be more, but that I've asked to leave the program. Uh, but it, I don't think that will happen anymore either. The program is always evolving to a certain degree. As we're evolving, as we're seeing, as we're feeling, it's organic. But carrying the lineage, we have certain things. One very important directive. Nothing is to be written. Nothing is to be videotaped. Nothing is 
to uh, be kept. Because when you start doing that, you start formulating. When you formulate, you no longer are working with an individual. You are no longer in the moment. And if anyone has ever asked me a definition of a spiritual practice, it is being in the moment. If you want to do a spiritual practice, be in the moment. If you're living in the moment, there is, fear does not live in the moment. Anxiety does not live in the moment. The moment doesn't have those things. Fear only lives in the future. Anxiety only is waves from the past. But if you're in the moment, it doesn't exist. We make all these, uh, oh, what if, what if, yeah, oh, George, why are you doing that? You just took yourself totally out of the moment. You just made yourself really crazy anxious. And you and what, what does it serve? What does it tell, if somebody can tell me here what unhappiness and anxiety, frustration serves, I would like to hear it. Does anyone want any of those things? Mm -hmm. I'm going to go home and be frustrated and be anxious and be unhappy. Well, wouldn't, it, wouldn't it be like if you didn't know what frustrated, angry, and unhappiness was, you wouldn't be able to be uh, happy and joyful and loving as much as you would? Because I don't know that that's true. Is that true? I don't know. It sounds kind of counter. <laughs> I think because you don't know what it is, right? I mean, if you don't know, well, what, if you don't what know what it is, then it doesn't is. exist in your field. <coughs> that's true. Then you wouldn't know what it was. So one of the analogies I talk about this work is, if you're in Africa and they've never seen an apple, you know what an apple is. I want you to tell the African who's never seen an apple what an apple is. What it tastes like. What does it taste like? What does it look like? What is it? You can't. Now, if someone wants, you know, someone is really intent on making you really unhappy, they probably can, can do it, and they might be able to. But if you're really joyful and you really see the humor behind it, my poor husband, he has a problem with that. And he tries to get me angry, and I laugh at him. I go, what are you doing? You're doing what? And it's very frustrating when you're trying to get somebody to get anxious and they're laughing at you. And I'm not laughing as a bad thing. I'm literally laughing like, what are you talking about? My big issue with something is I laugh way too much. I see, I see humor in so much. It's like, you're doing what? I, if, if I was going to write a book, it'd be the book of duh. Not <laughs> now, it'd be duh. Like, you didn't get it? But I don't think we need to know what pain, ang anxiousness, and anxiety is to be able to be liberated from it. I believe liberation is liberation. You see a little child, they're not, they don't have those things, but they learn it. They didn't come in with it, they learned it. They learned how to be anxious. They learned how to be aggressive. They learned all that. They didn't, no one comes in that way. We come in pretty pure. We learn all of the bad habits. <laughs> Our society does a good job. Any other questions on that? It was a pretty good one. That was a good one. Anybody? Okay, I'm gonna go back to pulses. You won't entertain me, I'll have to entertain you. <laughs> Okay, so pulses. So I, I alluded to, oh, everyone has the same pulse. So to come into the program, you one of the teachers needs to read your pulses. Not only me, other teachers can do it. They can do it excellent. They just kind of pass it off on me most of the time. Um, I like doing it, so it's not a big deal. I, I like, I don't think it's a big deal. If there's something I don't like in my life, I don't do it. How's that? It's pretty easy. So they come in at a pulse. Now, how do you become a practitioner? Your pulse changes. How do you become a teacher? Teacher's pulse changes. How did I learn these? I, I had a group of lamas in Kathmandu. They are all now passed. That would help me with my frustration and keep them like, how do I do that? Why do I do that? So they taught me. I thought, Everybody can do Tibetan cranial. <laughs> Come on in and do Tibetan cranial. We're going to do it every weekend for a few months, and it was awful. I didn't have a classroom to learn 
how to teach the work. Do you understand that? I was the only one. I had no one else to talk to. No one else to spin off of other than my llamas and we talk about spiritual stuff. And llamas can do empowerments. They can pull all these amazing things from the ether. But there was no school that I went to to learn this. The way that you usually learn is you go to school, the teacher teaches you, and you can make some format from the teachings you got from a teacher, yes? And nobody wanted my school of slapping them. Nobody wanted to work for, or from as soon as the sun came up till late at night and be slapped all day. Besides, I probably would have injured my hands also in slapping people. So it couldn't go on that way. So it took me some years to format and change and we're still constantly evolving. But there's one thing that doesn't evolve, and that is my teacher's touch. Everybody is Cal who You were saying that tonight, didn't you, Sid, weren't you? Were you saying that about when Linda was touching you, I was touching you, yeah. that it's the same touch. It's the same calibration of pressure. Not the same person, can't be. It's not the exact same mudras, but that inviolateness is in there. Does that make sense? So we carry the lineages in so many different ways. And it's transformative. And it's tr there is no one that gets out of this, I don't know if I see how you see it, but, um, without the transformation that happens. You don't, it's not possible. And it's not possible, like St. Germain says, to live one way and pray another. When you're, for every breath becomes a prayer. Just think about that. If every breath you had was a prayer, wouldn't that be an amazing life? And we're all, our ego is the only thing that gets in our way for of everything. We, we do this ego talk all the time, which is the ego says, Oh, you're incredible, you're brilliant, you're the best on the planet. And the other ego says, you are shit, what are you thinking? Don't let anyone see what that face is. If you are really the worst shit on the planet, what are you, <laughs> why are you even breathing? You know. So you have these two little heads that are constantly juggling. I'm not saying you want to kill both the heads, but maybe you want to come back into the moment. Because maybe, maybe you are the shit of the world, and maybe you're the goddess. And you're, you're probably both. In Tibet, the high lamas have malas, prayer beads. They were made out of human skull. Yeah, really. Now this human skull could be made out of the bone of the most highest lama. Their skull turned into these malas. Or a murderer and rapist, scum of the earth, turned into these malas. They believe the malas are sacred no matter which way, and you don't know which way they are. I think it's kind of cool. <laughs> yeah. I really do. I think it's just such an interesting theory that there really isn't in every person that thinks that they're an absolute saint, they've got flaws. They're a person. Every person who we think is just the worst seed on the planet, they, they had a, a mother. You know, they, they learned so much, you know. So it's, it's all yin and yang. It's, it's all part of the dance, and it's all part of the schooling. And it's all part of our spiritual evolution. And what are you here for? If you're not going into mukti, liberation, what are you here for? Does it take up space? Does it breathe air, eat food? Who knows what you're here for? <laughs> <laughs> but there's maybe more than that, doesn't there? Yeah, I know this, this is back at this ego thing, right? but it's not really ego. I, I truly am one of the happiest people on the planet. I know it, I really do. I wake up in the morning happy, and I go to sleep at night happy. Now, there are things out there and people out there that really try, work really hard to take my happiness away, but unless I give it, it doesn't go away. I mean, there are many people in this room that know me pretty well, and, well, Linda, Luca's a really good friend, teacher. Do you think I'm pretty happy? Oh, she's 
I'm obnoxiously happy when folks wake up. <laughs> you know, I am the person in the morning, I get up really early, who wakes up and is like, yay, a new day. And you know, everyone wants to say, shut up, Char. And it is, you know, can you be able to tune it down a couple of degrees? And we go, oh, thank you. It's so amazing. I'm breathing. Look at what I'm doing. I have a body. Isn't this incredible? <laughs> And then I get to see people all day. And I get to see people all day. I do sometimes want to get in my little rooms and not see people all day. But I, I'm so joyed that I get to see people all day. Because I get to see amazing beings. By the time they come to see me, it's amazing, these people. They're amazing. They teach me so much. They teach me so much. I mean, some, some of the beings I see are suffering so greatly. They're, some of them are at the end of their, their, their time on the planet. And they're still joyous. They're still happy. When I used to live in Denver, I, I had three kids and I was like, mm, yeah, mm. I would, every now and then I'd get on the handicap bus with all the handicapped people and just watch with all their disabilities and see them enjoy and then just go, Dad, Dad, you know, look, you've got everything. Why would you be so unhappy? You shouldn't be unhappy. We have to really realize our happiness. And we have Mother's Day coming up soon. Mother's Day is just in a couple of days. And it's not, it's really celebrating the goddess. Everyone had a mother. Some people are still mothers and some people are still mothering. And some people are still mothering. But <laughs> <laughs> we, we have this, if you came in this lifetime and had that love from one being, that mother, that goddess, you can carry that your whole life. And you don't have to be a biological mother to be a mother. You just have to be a female. And all the males also have female in them. And they've also had mothers, and they still have the divine feminine in them. The truth is, everybody's yin-yang. Everybody's a dot of different in each one. But I think we can all we can all just go for the divine mother and honor her. Don't you think? Mm -hmm. I mean, why not? We we get so defensive, like we so feel like if we honor someone or we do service, it's going to take something away from us. There is a grand delusion. You are so delusional. It's just the opposite. The more you serve, the more you have. The more you give, the more you get. You guys keep getting us backwards. <coughs> Do you get it? You start to understand it? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm done talking. No, I need some questions out there. Let's, let's go for some questions. I'm sure you have some good ones, and I am sure I have not said something I was supposed to, because that's normal for me. Amy, Devin, I think Devin knows you. Anybody who has something that they want to, okay, hand it up. I have a question. Oh, but you gotta tell me who you are because okay. I'm, you, you know where the, um, where you're doing Zoom, you see those little ghost people? You're little ghost people to me because I can't see your faces. Go ahead. Yeah, my name is Andrea. Andrea. And I find it um, interesting how the pulse, you're talking about how the pulse changes from practitioner to apprentice to teacher. Yeah. Does that happen over a series, like a period of time, or do they go good to the question. because of the pulse change? Mm -hmm. No, a good question because it is, it is a little bit of a brutal process. Uh, yeah, <laughs> this is this is my my big angst with the whole work itself because that just tears me up. Um, there is a there is a poem, and I really wish I had it because I don't have it. That a snake, when it's shedding its skin is painful. It's really painful for that skin to come off the snake because it's actually ripping off. But if the snake doesn't shed its skin, it dies in the old skin. It can't live without shedding it. But it, it takes some discomfort to shed it. Like when we're shedding an old principle or an old philosophy, it's painful, right? Oh, I always believed that, but I don't believe that anymore. And there's tears that usually go like that. Oh, no, I'm going to grieve because that no longer fits me. And so what happens in this transition is sometimes, my lovely Leanna out there, um, sometimes it takes 
six months, a year, it takes a while. And it's a profound spiritual ex um, expression. And the people in our program that are really pretty high spiritually, not, not that one's higher than another, um, go through more suffering during that time. And there is, I'm not saying that we say our work doesn't harm. It, I mean, that is not a harming suffering. It's a suffering letting go of the old self. Are you following me? <laughs> so when when you are turning into a practitioner, like a, a butterfly go into a cocoon, it has to do a lot of movement to do that. Because they're doing a lot to move out of your shell. <clears throat> so during that transition, then they go into a pulse that now is a practitioner's pulse. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Then their practitioner's pulse, they might be in forever. They're, they're, they're fine. But there might be a part of them that is supposed to be a teacher. And then they go into that teacher's pulse and then they emerge from that also. It's very strange, I understand. It's just as strange as empowerments. Empowerments are very interesting. We have so many empowerments woven through this work. If you could probably see it on a scale, it would look like a tapestry. There are so many lamas and spiritual beings that have put energy to contain this work that it is amazing. Um, and I've been blessed to have many empowerments given to me and empowerments that I can give back out. Um, Linda has a few uh, people, like Amy, Amy got empowerments too. Uh, our, we have a lineage teacher, we have a, Nyawan Tenzin in Bhutan, who has given, who loves this community, who's taken this on as his community. And he has given many of your teachers empowerments that they can give out. And empowerments are um, kind of like etheric cords that can be pulled from different venues, through spiritual venues. and they weave back into our work. And they actually kind of embrace the whole work itself. Make sense? Mm -hmm. So we don't take things lightly. If someone isn't meant to do this work, then they, they don't do it. It doesn't mean that they can't do it. It just means they can't do it now. It doesn't mean in a year, six months, or tomorrow they couldn't. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And every single person in this organization has told me the same thing, and I'm gonna say the same thing for myself too, is they're inexplicably drawn. No one can really figure out why they're drawn. No one in, in the whole community can give a concrete reason why this is a part of their spiritual completion. Myself included. I look at myself someday and say, People think you're a crazy person. You are a crazy person. <laughs> you know, what are you doing? You know, what are you doing? And we're inexplicably drawn. Most of the people, if not all of them in this program, are incarnates. They have done this work before. There's something about it. You see them working and they don't even know why. But it's like their hands are slipping into gloves and they're doing mudras that they don't even know why, but they're working. I knew this was my work. When mm -hmm. I found this work, I just said, this is my work. Mm -hmm. And you can't say why. You can't say why. Mm -hmm. You know more than you can say why? I love my husband. <laughs> if you knew my husband, you'd understand why I'm saying I love my husband. But why I love him would make absolutely no sense. Really would make no sense. Other than I'm inexplicably drawn to him. He is supposed to be my partner. He is the person that I'm supposed to be doing my dance with. Oh, it's so much fun. Um, but you don't, you know, you can't say, I want you to, okay. The allopathic, the medical people, they love to gauge things by machines, right? Mm -hmm. They put you in this machine, they say you've got this readout, this is normal. So that they know what normal is, is beyond me right there. If they could tell me what love looks like on that machine, I would say machines are good. If they could tell me what spiritual evolution looks like on that machine, I would say that machine is great. 
if they could tell me why we're doing this kind of work and putting it on a machine, I'd be really happy. <laughs> but the truth is, those things that we can't put in a machine or that we can't truly explain are the jewels of our lives. They are the most richest parts of our lives. We were talking meditation just a little while ago, and I'm going, I can't put it into words that really are no words that come from it. I could make a little stories up, but this is not really true. The essence of something is the essence of something. And it, it, when it goes beyond words, it has a truth to it. I see a hand right there. <laughs> That's a good one because we think of the pulse as being like the heart pulse. Yeah. But um, in Ayurveda, Tibetan, and Chinese, any Asian medicine that you take pulse diagnosis with, you are reading many things. Um, you you can read like what every muscle, every bone, every gland. You can read what people's dharma is, what's happening in their life, big issues that have happened in their lives. Yeah, you know an awful lot about that person when you're done the pulses. And there is a particular healing pulse in many people, not a lot, but many. Everybody in our organization has a healing pulse, but it has a certain frequency for this work, which is really wild. I know it sounds strange, but it's not, it's, it's, you, it's done on the thumb side, you, it's, if you ever want to learn about pulses, start out with something like Dr. Lev's Signature of the Pulse. Great book. Start learning about pulses. Um, you don't have to know a lot about pulses to really do the work, though. I just like them. I just think they're really cool. I know Heidi likes them, too. I think there's lots of us who like the pulses because we get such information. And the information helps us decipher. Um, again, it's talking to the, to the soul. You're talking to the soul. And when I'm talking to the soul, I have to ask the soul a question. And when I'm asking it the question, uh, is that person meant to do the work? It's going to give me an answer. And it's pretty clear. Sharky needs to have something to say. I was, just, was I was just wondering, just to follow up on the pulses. Um, so to be a pra uh, an apprentice, you have to have a certain pulse, right? And then you wait till your pulse shifts to become a practitioner. And I was wondering, which in my mind would make sense, is that once you shift into that practitioner pulse, is it almost like joining a certain frequency, right? Where you tune into wherever you, you get support from the work in a way, right? From everybody else who's in the same pulse. So you, you're in that same river. So the work just becomes a little bit more powerful. So your technique might be perfect, your whatever, it has nothing to do with that. You just get infused with that support from Absolutely. others, right? Absolutely. Yeah. With a little minor exception on that, I'm feeling the sneeze this way, no matter what. Um, yeah, it was probably gonna happen right where I wanted to. Um, and that is, when that pulse goes into the transition and it does link into a different level. Most of my apprentices are very sad because they liked their little community of apprenticeship. And now they have to go to college. They have to say, bye home. I now have to, you know, go and be a grown up. Bye. There's a certain grace about giving service and staying in the, your community of people that are learning. And you come in with people. Now, this is the other hard part, is that let's say a group of five people come into the program. Out of those five people, they're not all going to release at the same time. I have not yet been able to get an avocado to ripen. I've been working on it for years. I say avocado ripen, 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 and it goes beyond my finger. We had one lady, how long with Janelle in? Five years? Now this woman, beautiful being, amazing with the work, amazing spiritual being, amazingly kind. She watched all of her friends go. She watched the classmates after her go. 
she watched other people go. I'm in tears now when I'm taking her pulse. I'm going, please, <laughs> whatever it is, please. You know, this is causing me suffering, stop. You know, I'm about ready to cry every, the joke was she's gonna get her on the walker. I mean, she'll be 90 years old by the time we get her on the program. And she's got a walker. She, for, her, for her releasing ceremony, she got a walker. <laughs> oh because it was starting to become, and then she stayed with it. She never stopped. She never let her ego come in and said, I'm not worth it. Why am I here five years when somebody else just got released in two and a half years? Mm -hmm. I, I'm telling you, that is a great being. Mm -hmm. That their ego didn't come in and say, screw this program. <laughs> I've had enough. If I gotta go to one more training and it's costing me each time and that crazy woman is saying I'm not out of here, I'm out of here. <laughs> yeah. I, she's a saint. Mm -hmm. As far as I'm concerned, I don't know that I could have done that. I think about it, anyone in this room, do you think you could have done that? She was like my hero. I couldn't believe it. I mean, her family's all saying, when is she going to release her? When? And she's lovely. She's, she's great with the work. She's a lovely being. We also had another man who was in seven years. Because he didn't want to get out. <laughs> he said, I get to be in a spiritual community. I get great food. I get to do yoga, meditation. It's not very much money. Why do I want to get out? <laughs> Seven years is too long. The pulse has changed three years ago. And you're like, yeah. We finally got him out. But because you're saying, like, what, what better can I do? Twice a year I get to go be in my spiritual community. He was right. Make sense? <laughs> Any other questions out there? Oh, I see a hand. Who's <coughs> attached to? Um, it's Rinchen. <laughs> I have. I was just wondering, how long did you do your apprenticeship with the Lama in Nepal? Oh no, there's a good one. I was with my Lama. Mm, I can't remember. It was about three, four weeks, something like that. Now, okay. Now it doesn't sound like very long, does it? The problem was, and this is logistically a problem. My visa ran out. So. In my little Western mind, it's like, okay, I go home, and in a few months, I'll go back. Six months, I'll get back over there, and, and I'll find him. I will find him. Well, what does he do? He drops his body. That wasn't very nice. <laughs> I think he knew that he was going to drop his body when I was there with him. But I didn't want him to, so... He's not allowed to drop his body. Well, he did it anyway. That's why it took me years to decipher the information. That's why I had to go to other llamas to help me. That's why I ended up in the Tibetan Hall Medical Records and Dharmasala. That's why I set up a network literally all over the world of people with this work. Literally, it's a network of it. Going all over trying to find other people. But he knew. I knew. I just was in resistance for him causing more suffering for me. He, 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 he sent so many empowerments in me. I told this story before, most of you. I, he sent so many empowerments for me when I was on the plane going back home. The woman next to me asked to be moved because I was shaking. I just, my physical body could hardly take all that he put inside of me. And I shook for about, 48 hours, literally, shaking and without stopping. This, <laughs> I can't even do it. <laughs> it's like, who wants to sit next to me? <laughs> I got home and my husband thought, <laughs> he put me in the hot tub. He said, oh, you gotta do something about you. <laughs> I can't pick some up from the airport and they're vibrating the whole time. So I said, go ahead. Well, I was thinking, <clears throat> you've got uh, these times when it feels like it's automatic mode, like someone else is, you put your gloves on and it's like something else is uh, empowering this whole thing. I, and I believe personally I'm having a, an issue about free will. Mm. Now, doesn't, wouldn't that sort of um, point you to the conclusion that you have no free will and this whole thing is all just somebody's 
play that's acting out on the cosmic scale and that you really don't have any choice in your life and that this is either going to find you because you are chosen for it and you have no free will and that's where maybe some of this stuff that just kind of poof happens comes from because we only have the equipment that we are got brought here with right and we don't have maybe the the ability to know everything else because we don't have the proper equipment and that we're just all in automatic mode i mean yeah you're right <laughs> I mean, yeah, free will is one of those interesting little deals i think it's overrated you know <laughs> i'm not really sh i right now there's a big up thing up in my field about free will mm -hmm. but i do believe that people it's back to the service slavery thing. If we are on a course, like a river, is it free will or not free will? Well, that's a good question. Uh, not one that I can answer, because that's got to be found in everybody's own heart, how they see that. Yeah. Because I personally believe that if you're on your, your path, no matter, and I get nailed on this all the time, because this is a phrase my old community years all the time, is everything.